Hello, and welcome to a special Gardener's World, which is all about celebrating the gardening year. And what a year to take on a new garden. One of those things that's important in a garden is the light, where it comes up and where it goes down. And here, I'm just adding these grasses. So this stiper, this will grow to about 1.5 metres. You can already see, it just catches the light and that'll hold its form right through the winter months. And all right, the pace has slowed, but there is still loads we can get on with in the garden to make sure next year is even better. Coming up on today's programme, Francis visits RHS Wisley, where heathers are being given a new lease of life. What I love here is that they've planted them tumbling out of these big old terracotta pots. Looks really Mediterranean, but using a plant that you wouldn't normally associate with that kind of scheme. So it's a little bit playful, but I think it works really well. Carol surrounds herself with summer colour at Hannam Court. What is it about the rose that makes it so entrancing? Put purely and simply, they inject the whole place with a sense of romance and joy. Just take a look at that. Need I say any more? There's a touch of the Mediterranean at Toby's place as he harvests his olives. I'd love to tell you I've done something special to get these olives. I fed them with a magical elixir, but I haven't. These plants just thrive on neglect, quite frankly, and being ignored. And I will be building a rose arch, doing something interesting with black currants, plus giving this soil some much needed love. Interesting, isn't it, with plants? Things come and go, fashion-wise. Things like the grasses don't seem to be everybody's cup of tea. But for me, they provide movement, a moment of calm. How fantastic winter structure. And I think a lot of us disengage with our gardens through the winter months because we don't feel there's enough colour out there. Well, in February, Francis went to RHS Wisley to find out a little bit more about a plant that I think is definitely on the way back. Hunting for colour in our winter gardens can be a slightly disheartening task. We've embraced silhouettes of evergreens and architectural seed heads and grasses. And, like the changing fashion for flares, garden designers are beginning to re-embrace that most 1970s of plants, the heather. Now, my association with heathers is on moorlands and heathlands and wild landscapes, which are some of my favourite places to be, so I love them just for that alone. And it also shows how resilient they are as a plant. They can cope with extreme drought and extreme wind and extreme cold temperatures, and then also a lot of very wet conditions in the winter. So for any gardener in any aspect, and even in a very tough spot, you can grow them. And why wouldn't you have one of these in your garden? In the depths of winter, these beautiful jewel-like colours can really lift the space. They can be white, they can be pinks and purples and really deep colours as well. They just look so stunning, don't they? There are three main types of heather. Erica, Kaluna and Daboecia. And the majority of these thrive on free-draining acidic soil. However, some of the winter flowering ericas can also cope with neutral to alkaline conditions. For containers, most would prefer a free-draining ericaceous compost. This one 
is an Erica, and this is Cross Dahlensis Winter Surprise. It has a really beautiful coloured flower, and I think, especially in the winter with a frosty backdrop, it would look really beautiful. You can always tell Erica's by a few defining features. Now, the first is the leaves, which look needle-like. They have a sort of conifer appearance. But they also have a mass of bell-shaped flowers, and they can come in summer or winter, but if you see a winter flowering heather, then you know it's an Erica. But the key defining feature of Erica is that these flowers have a protruding stigma and stamen. Now, the stamen is brown or dark brown. This one's almost black and the stigma will be pink or white. And if you see that, then you know you're looking at an Erica. And what I love here is that they've planted them tumbling out with these big old terracotta pots. Looks really Mediterranean, but using a plant that you wouldn't normally associate with that kind of scheme. So it's a little bit playful, but I think it works really well. Kaluna heathers also have conifer-like foliage, but more scaly, like a Leylandii. They flower in spring and summer, budding on new growth and either bloom into tiny flowers or demurely remain closed. The shrub-like Daboecia also put on their colourful display in spring and summer, but their flowers are sparse. However, what they lack in quantity, they more than make up for in size. Now, tree heathers are some of my favourite kinds of heather. This one isn't the true tree heather. In fact, that's over there. That's Erica arborea, and it's about to flower, but a little bit later than this one. This is Erica lusitanica, still a kind of tree heather, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Look, these tiny buds are pink, and then when they open up, the flowers are white. There's been a collection of heather here since the early 20th century. And until recently, it was set out in a 1970s island bed pattern. But in 2018, the planting was given a very modern makeover. The 12 small beds were replaced with just two large heather beds with 25,000 heathers in drifts and ribbons to vary the color palette. But what really brings this design into the 21st century are the heather's new plant companions. In a genius move, the team here have combined drought-tolerant grasses and yuccas in amongst the scheme, which also enjoy the same conditions as the heather and add texture. And of course, not forgetting the true 1970s roots of a heather garden, they've also included conifers. But here, they really bring some height to the whole scheme. With movement in mind, Grasses crisscross the beds to complete the look and give a lighter feel to the planting, responding to the slightest of breeze. Low growing evergreens, shrubs and herbs are woven amongst the heathers, giving it that Mediterranean feel. And popping up throughout are these surprising structural plants. This is a yucca rostrata, and of course something you would absolutely never expect to see on a heather moorland. But actually, although it's evolved in a completely different part of the world, it's evolved in very similar conditions to heather. So very arid and very free draining, which means it lives very happily alongside these plants. And in terms of design, it gives a tall, billowing, textural height and animates an otherwise quite flat landscape. Natalie Plumbridge helped plant thousands of the heathers and knows how much they can support us and wildlife in the colder months. In winter, just that accent of bright colour is so needed, isn't it? It is, yeah. A lot of people want summer colour. Not many people will think, oh, in a dark, gloomy winter's day, to have a bit of colour in the winter. But these heathers will just do amazing. And then also for all the pollinating insects that may be around now, that's a little bit of nectar for them too. Yeah, so um, we've got an apiary meadow just down um, beyond the grass garden and on a really nice bright winter's day, you see the honeybees coming in just to get that last little bit of nectar from the garden. It just gives the bees that permanent food source down here. <laughs>
first three years, um, just let it establish itself. Um, they're very slow growing and then just reducing it by a third. A case of not going into old wood and stuff, just like a lavender? Yeah, just like a lavender. Okay. And with a summer flowering variety, that would be a completely different method? Oh yeah, completely different. So with summer flowering types, um, you prune them from the first year of being in the soil. So from year one to three, you prune them by about 50%. It sounds really drastic, but they will love you for it. Okay, and what time of year would that be? Around October, November time. Just as it starts to create this nice new growth at the tips is prime time to tell your summer flowering heather that it wants to be cut. Now as gardeners, we have a first-hand view of how unpredictable the climate can be. Some years it's so dry, some years it's really wet and windy. And more and more we will see plants like heathers that are really resilient being used. And I think when they're as beautiful as this, that has to be a good thing. The moment I see a heather, I still think of my old man. He had them planted right through our front garden in containers. So, structurally, I've got lots of jobs that I want to do over the winter months. And one thing that's been bugging me ever since I moved in here is coming down in the morning, putting the kettle on, looking out the kitchen window, and I look at that gate. Yeah, I know. I need a new gate, but that's a little bit further down the road. But also, what I'm trying to do is break this space up. So I don't want you just to come in and see everything. At the moment, you walk through the gate and the whole garden just reveals itself. There's no decisions, there's no pause point. Also, imagine the sun hits this wall, it's a light coloured stone. It can feel a bit uncomfortable. If you imagine I can get some roses growing up there, the whole thing feels softer. So all I want to do here is put an arch. What I've done so far is I've put two vertical posts in. I've dug holes that are 60 centimetres deep. I've concreted one in. This one, I'm just finishing off. And I'm just making sure that these are vertical, which they are at the moment. Put that back up there, double check. They're the same level because we're going to have cross beams here that fix back to the wall. And then I prop it and I screw the top of that prop just to hold everything firm in place. What I've also done is I've put a dry concrete mix around each post. You can buy it in small bags. We can water this, and then what I do with my stick is just start to work the water into the mix, make sure that there's no air pockets. So once that's worked in, what I would do is I would let that go off for 24 hours before I started to do any work. The one there I actually put in yesterday so that I can put the arch over. I put that down, scrub this spirit level again. Just double check. Totally vertical. This is definitely one of those jobs though, where you want to check, check, check again. Because those beams have got to go across there and hit those brackets. But that is later on. First, we've got some glorious spring colour. We're off to King's Lynn to meet tulip grower Mark Eves. For me, it's a passion, a way of life. And when you get a field like this, you can't help but be proud and have a bit of a lump in your throat sometimes. We are the only commercial bulb grower in the UK of tulips. Uh, and I'm quite proud of that. I believe in grown, not flown. 75% of all tulip flowers sold in the UK are produced in the UK. Are we a rival to Holland? I'm not quite sure. We're a family business. We started back in the 60s, late 60s. Outside, we've got 140 acres and we're growing nearly 80 million tulips outdoors. We're growing in Norfolk for the soil types. We've, in a close area, we've got quite a few different types of sandy soil, would you believe? But there's heavy sand, there's light sand, there's red sand. That all helps us put the right tulip with the right type of soil 
because the tulip likes water to grow, but it doesn't like to sit in the winter months in a cold, wet environment of heavy soils. None of these flowers which are actually in this field will actually be picked or cut for cut flowers. Every single one, the head will be taken off and then we're looking for that bulb to be utilised in the winter months in our glass houses. By taking the heads off, you're stopping that producing a seed bud and that seed bud takes an awful lot of energy out of that bulb to produce. So by removing those heads, that won't happen. All of that energy from those leaves go back down into the bulb. But at home, I think you might want to actually pick some flowers and use them in the home. So snap them off, try and leave two clear leaves on the bottom of the plant. That way, you're still going to gain a good bulb for next year, as well as a nice vase full of flowers for the home. We grow 30 million indoors during the winter months, which start in December, going through till June. These bulbs were in our field, or were planted in our field, back three calendar years ago, and we're actually now turning them into flowers. I think people don't realise what's gone into making that bunch of flowers. When they grab that off the shelf, it's quite a long process. We're growing the tulips for a, for a 20 week season, which starts early December. So we're looking for some nice early varieties and we're looking for some mid-season as well as some nates. And I think if you're doing that in the garden as well, you're going to extend your flowering period for probably up to eight weeks. But the best varieties for an early season is something like a friendship, something like that, um, which is a nice bright yellow. Then you can go through to some of the purple princes and things like that as well. Then on to the good old-fashioned apple dorms, which are a beautiful tulip and I still love those. All the tulips indoors are grown on, on water. A little bit of nutrition in the water, but not, not a lot. It's quite actually natural for them to be grown on water because they are actually a mountain plant. So they're getting all their water and nutrition from the water running down the sides of the mountain. So if to grow them on just water alone is, is not unusual. It's far more natural actually for the tulip than what we actually used to do years ago growing them in soil. A lot of people ask me what's the easiest or the best way to start growing tulips. For me, in the garden, it's probably better to start with the darker varieties, the darker colours. They're a lot easier to grow than the lighter colours. The lighter colours are more problematic. The better varieties of reds are the, the debutante is one of my favourites. I love the name, let alone the flower itself and the deep pink. The yellow, the strong gold, is one of the strongest growing tulips there are. Right, this is one of my favourite tulips. It's first class, and it is first class because it starts off as a white bud and then it slowly evolves into the nice pinkness of it. The first class is quite a good tulip, quite a good all-rounder. It doesn't mind the heavier soils as long as they're not waterlogged. I visit the field every single week of the year whilst there's a crop in here growing but especially when we're looking to lift the bulbs. It's very important to get that precise point when they're ready to lift. It can be down to hours difference. Six to eight hours makes an awful lot of difference in the maturity of the bulb at that time of year. So it's very key to be very on the ball with what's happening in the field. When I sit here looking around me at the beautiful colours, the bright, luminous yellow almost, the pinks, the reds, the deep red over that far side is absolutely glorious. It, it does make me very proud of, of what we've done here. And I'm only one small part of that, but I'm very proud of what we do. Mark, proud? I should think so. The time and effort that goes into producing a cut flower really blew my mind. And talking about time and effort, ever since we moved in here, I've been trying to improve this soil. And one way of doing that is mulching. I'm in a really sort of dry part of the country. So really started mulching 
probably from September. Make sure there's some moisture starting to appear in the ground and then lock that moisture in. And I'm just carrying that through all the way through to probably next March, April. If you're somewhere that's slightly wetter, then your window becomes shorter, so you're probably not going to mulch until going well into next spring. Because I think if anything kills plants, it is that winter wet more than the cold. And sometimes it can feel like it's a big investment in the garden. But for me, it's something that's definitely worthwhile. Could be your own compost, the green compost that you can get from the council. Just do a little bit of research. A lot of this stuff we can buy in bulk. Maybe it's something you could do with a neighbour. I'm putting about 50 mil of well-rotted manure with a little bit of composted bark. So what that'll do is, first of all, it'll lock the moisture in. It'll keep the weeds down. But also, for me, the most important thing is over time, it'll rot down and it'll put goodness back into that soil. Around sort of anything that's wooded, trees, shrubs, what you want to do is make sure you keep that compost back. You don't really want the mulch around the throat there of the plant because what it will do is it will start to damage the bark and slowly kill the plant. So keep that back. When it comes to herbaceous plants, you can mulch in around those. So, if you're in a drier part of the country like I am and you haven't done any mulching yet, what have you been doing? Get out there. <laughs> Now, I do like somebody that thinks outside the box when it comes to ideas and gardens. And we've got one of your films. We're off to Norfolk to meet John Greenfield. And he's doing something rather creative with tempos. As a keen gardener, I really like my flowers and I really like my vegetables. But the thing I take most pleasure from is making garden structures. I designed and built an arcade for my lime trees using fiberglass tent poles. They're cheap, easily purchased online and flexible enough to form a semicircle. But I would need some weights to keep the arcade the same height. But there was a problem. The structure wobbled in the wind. To make sure the arcade remained in place on stormy days, I ran a steel line through some plastic tubes. I attached one line to the top of the arcade and some others down the sides. The structure was finished, but I'll need to spend the next decade tying the lime tree branches into shape. Once they've grown enough, I'll take the tent poles down and let the arcade mature on its own. It's late summer and I think it's time for an update uh, the first thing I actually wanted to check was the structure. And you can see it still remains very flexible. It's had uh, two full winters of wind and rain, and I'm pretty pleased. I think it's in good condition. The plants also are doing quite well, but it has been so dry here. So they're beginning to die back and you can see some dead leaves on them. On the most advanced plants, I have started to prune them. So I'm looking for five leaders from the plant. And what I've been doing is stripping those back a little bit. So I've, I've pruned the lower portion of them and left the growth on the upper portion. And I've started to tie them in to the structure so they will follow the form. And you can see that's the main, main leader. It's almost reached the middle. And on this side, I've got a similar leader, which is coming on. So it won't be too much longer before they join in the middle and I can start to form the arch that I'm really looking for. John, I think you might have started something. I can already see half the nation out in the garages looking for the tents they don't use anymore. Ingenious. Still to come on today's programme. Carol surrounds herself with seasonal splendour at Hannam Court, a garden that is brimming with roses. It just says, summer, aren't we lucky to be alive? The insects are buzzing, the birds are singing, and the flowers are certainly blooming. 
and we catch up with sisters, Kirsty, Becky and Mandy, as they plant up their new borders. You're going to grab a handful, yeah. yep, and we're going to throw them in the garden and then they'll look really natural yeah. where they fall. Should we try it? Yeah. See if it works. Should we throw them right next to Dad's bench? Yeah. There you go, Dad. Okay, Dad. I'm a she. But first, we're off to Devon. We caught up with Toby earlier in the year as he carried out a few spring jobs. Blue skies, sparkling sea, seagulls nicking your chips. It might not be a tropical paradise, fair enough. But for me, Devon in the springtime, nowhere does it better. As well as the forget-me-nots and spring bulbs, our milder climate means that we can overwinter tender plants like this. Now, this is Japanese banana, or Musa Bazju, and it does produce bananas, but actually in the Far East, it's, it's grown for its fibre. In the garden, it's a brilliant ornamental plant, really big, really bold, and the name of the game with it is to get it to establish for at least two winters, and then it's got enough heft to shrug off any cold snaps that come. That said, I still take cuttings of it. Although bananas look like trees, they are herbaceous perennials. They grow from down below the ground. Look at that. All the leaves are wrapped up inside and they make this beautiful ammonite. It's a really lovely spiral shape. And believe it or not, they bounce back so quickly. That central leaf, in an hour or so, will be an inch or two tall. And in a few weeks' time, I'll have lots of side shoots I can dig up and pot up and give to friends. I also grow another type of banana. Well, technically, it's known as an Enset, the Abyssinian banana. A really handsome thing. Now, a plant like this set you about 30, 50 quid. By the end of the summer, it'll be twice the size. It could cost about 120. And the reason they're so expensive is that they've been sort of caught up in the fashion for house plants. Because it's quite tender, it's got to overwinter indoors. When it comes to propagating this, the starting point is cutting off the top. Same again, so I'll go in there. Look away now if you have a nervous disposition. This will grow back in no time. But unlike the Japanese banana, this doesn't regrow from side shoots. It has to regrow from the central stem or the pith at the base. And you can see there, just in the center, that is the corm or the growing part of the plant. You can see all the leaves and the structure of it. And from here, new plants will grow. Now that is edible actually. I went to Ethiopia a few years ago and I did eat this. I was given this as a dish. <laughs> it, was, it was like eating flour straight from a packet, but it's full of starch and it certainly keep you going. I'm just gonna get them buried out of the light, down into some compost, keep them somewhere warm, and then those cut edges will start to grow new buds. And it doesn't take long. These are some that I did, what, a few weeks ago. And I know they're growing away because, you see the roots growing out the bottom of the pot. Always a good sign. Look at that. Now, the way I break these up is I drop them onto the bench, just shatters the compost away from the roots without having to peel them and risk breaking any off. And you can see the starts of a good little plant there. There's the new leaves coming. Look at those roots. Pot it up, that'll be worth a fiver. By the end of the summer, it'll be 50. <laughs> I'm quids in. Fabulous. I cover them with compost. They'll be fine, and I'll pot them up in a bit. Because now, there's another edible that I'm really excited about. My crop of olives. I planted this olive tree. Must have been 14 years ago. Now, the soil here, because it's so free-draining, is terrible. It's the complete opposite of what gardeners call good. There's hardly any organic matter and it's full of stones. Well, it's like being in Greece. But those are the conditions, of course, that olive trees love, so it's good for them. But despite olive trees being surprisingly hardy, they are under threat from a disease called xylella, which has been a big problem on the continent. So, if you're after an olive tree, make sure you buy one from a reputable nursery or garden centre. 
They're self-fertile, and this one has always provided me with a smattering of berries. But it was only when I planted this tree here behind me that it really became abundant. Because the truth is, self-fertile trees always, always do better in company. I'd love to tell you I've done something special to get these olives. I've fed them with a magical elixir, but I haven't. These plants just thrive on neglect, quite frankly, and being ignored. Devon isn't the first place I've picked olives. When I was 18, I went to the Peloponnese uh, in Greece, near the Albanian border, and was picking olives there. There were so many olives on the trees, you didn't do it by hand, with little hand rakes. We'd rake them onto the floor and then put them into sacks. Here's a picture of me back in the day. There I am, up the ladder. The old school friends, Richie and Paul. Oh, happy but hard days. <laughs> But of course, there's more to olives than the fruit. I mean, even if you live in a part of the country where they don't produce reliably, the plants themselves are fantastic. I reckon they're the best silver evergreen going. Wonderful in a container, and I'll tell you why, is because they cope with drought. So even if you're the type of gardener that forgets to water their pots occasionally, well, olives are for you. And of course, they take pruning really well. The rule of thumb with anything that's, well, that's as borderline hard is, do it in the spring. Prune them as hard as you like, and then that gives them the whole summer to bounce back and look their best. So they're looking at their evergreen best for the whole of winter. That'll do. I'll give them a wash. Although they look glossy and really quite appetising now, they're so bitter. You've got to get that bitterness out. To cure the olives, you put them into a brine made of one part salt to ten parts water. And then to ensure that that brine gets into the olives, every single one you've got to score with the knife without cutting in to the stone in the middle. This is my second harvest. What I did the first time round was I stored them in oil, but to add a bit of flavour, I picked some rosemary from the garden and some garlic from the plot and stuck that into the jars as well. I'll tell you what, one thing, I don't know whether it's all my friends being polite, it probably is, <laughs> but they said they're the best olives they've ever tasted. I'd like to think they are. Once you've got them in the oil, they'll last for years. Perfect Christmas gift. Well, to keep them in the brine, the name of the game is to use a saucer. Just lay that over the top of them to hold them down into the drink. And you keep them in there, in somewhere cool, somewhere dark. You change the brine once a week for a month or so, or until the bitterness from the fruit disappears. Now these olives have already been through the curing process, and you can tell that because they're a bit more wrinkly, but just as glossy. Spoon them in, keep everything as sterile as you can. Get some good olive oil, and then pour that over the top. And there we are. Sunshine in a jar. For me, the taste of my youth. Toby, I look forward to my olives for Christmas. I'm sure you said you save them for your friends. Isn't Toby full of wonderful ideas? And funnily enough, a lot of them are about saving money. Whereas I've got an idea that's more about saving space. What I want to do is grow a blackcurrant against this fence. There's an area that's just tucked away, a little bit dark and dingy, and this fence is wasted space. And earlier on in the year, I was filming at Gravetime Manor, and I was walking around this amazing wall garden, but back against the north-facing wall, they had blackcurrants fanned, and it looked absolutely incredible. So I'm going to put that a good 20 centimetres under the ground and then fill that back in. When I'm putting this in, what I'm trying to do is work out how I'm gonna fan this plant. 
First of all, what I've done is I put in a little series of horizontal wires. The interesting thing is, obviously, imagine you're growing a normal bush plant in your back garden. Well, the fruit normally comes on last season's growth, so it tends to fruit really well on quite young growth. Here, it's going to be different. I've got to create that framework before I can start to worry about fruit. So these stems, I'm going to let them mature over the next few years. And then what I'll do is encourage that to fruit. It is an experiment and it will take time, but also it's fun and it will look good. So a little figure of eight so that the stems don't rub on the wires. You can already start to see that shape come. What I'm going to do in front of here is there was some rhubarb in the front garden. I'm going to divide that and then plant all the way through here. So rhubarb crumbles and black currant jam. What could be better than that? I can smell those black currants already. And that's the thing, isn't it, with gardens? Remember, they work with every single one of our senses. And on that note, one of your films now. And there's a young man that seems to really understand that. I'm David in Chelmsford in Essex, and this is my garden. It measures about eight metres by eight metres, so it's about 64 square metres in size. It's got a lot packed in it, there's a lot of perennials and annuals, and a lot of veg as well. Some of them are probably in the wrong places because I put them in at random points and didn't really consider the size of them that they get to when I put them in, but the bees love them and I think that's the main thing. Quite a few of the plants are in pots and I do cheat slightly because I have a drip irrigation system which saves a lot of time but also means that plants get an equal amount of water and I can easily control it using an app on my phone. Most of the tomato plants are in pots in front of the conservatory and they're doing well as you can see, they're forming fruits and they look very healthy. A big pumpkin plant here, which is sprawling across the lawn, which is fine. And all the veg was grown from seed, um, so that came up early spring this year, which was quite nice to see everything growing after the tough months of the, the winter. I really like plants that smell of food. Uh, this is a particularly good one. It's called Helio Heliotropium, and it really smells of, of cherry. It's got a really nice scent. And over here, there's a Pelagonium that smells of cola bottle when you, when you touch its leaves. It's really nice. And here I've got a Melianthus major, which smells of peanut butter when you sniff the leaves. Another favorite of mine is this chocolate smelling cosmos, which really does smell of chocolate. It's a really nice plant. David, that connection with your plants, that's absolutely great. But also, you don't seem to be wasting an inch in your garden. Wonderful, keep going. Over the past couple of years, you might have been following the progress of three sisters, Kirsty, Becky and Mandy, and they have been working their magic on their plot. And guess what? We got to catch up with them. This is Rebecca. Hee <laughs> hee. My name's Mandy. My name's Kirsty. We are Gunners Fairy Sisters. Ta da! It's been an exciting year in the garden. We decided to tackle our two overgrown borders one in the sun and one in shade. We got advice on the right plants, like Alcamilla for shade, and daisies and Lapita for sunshine and insects. Can you hear that bee? Yeah, buzzing, buzzing bee. We place them out first. There's a persimmon waving flower. It's that purple. And then pop them in. Let's do it. Is that where you want it? Yeah. Oh, Kirsty, that's amazing. Thank okay. you. Brilliant. The shady board has light twinkling through the leaves, and the planting definitely suited the spot and the gardeners. 
This one, Kirsty, is a Stranta Major Superstar, just like you. Very, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, it is. Right, let's get this one in. With Kirsty's regular care and a lot of love over the very hot summer, she kept them growing well. Now in autumn, both borders are looking good, but there's jobs and planning to do to keep them flourishing into the spring. The first job is cutting back the dead bits, and there's lots of them. Cut right back mm -hmm. to where this new... Look, see that there? Yeah. That's new growth. Mm -hmm. So if we cut this little bit back at the top, and then we'll have more flowers in the spring. Cool. Should we do that? OK. Go on, Tarzan. Yay. Some things needed more than a little trim. The grasses in the sunny border got huge, so we've recycled them elsewhere. Now there's space for new things, like daffodil bulbs. Let's tip some out then. Tip some out. And you're going to grab a handful. Yeah. Yep. And we're going to throw them in the garden, and then they'll look really natural. Yeah. Where they fall. Should we try it? Yeah. See if it works. These are mixed narcissi, all happy in dappled shade. Where would you like them? Well, everywhere. Everywhere, right. Should we throw them right next to Dad's bench? Yeah. There you go, Dad. Okay, Dad. I miss you. Right, <laughs> step to the blade. Push it there, grab a bulb. That's the one. There you go. Looking good. There's some for the sunny side too, but the main bulbs here are tulips in three different sorts. Favourite colours? Yeah, orange and dark purple. Nice. And I, my favourite, black tulips. Yeah, black tulips are great off night. Oh, so it is. Right, should we take them over? Yeah. Come on then. We don't know what colour they're going to be. I don't do, know. We don't know, do we? Because we've mixed them all up. We've also got some colour to freshen up the borders and the planters. Purple outside, um, little pollen inside. And as the daisies are working well in the sunny border, there's more going in here. This is daisy, 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 daisy. Do you want a hand, Kirsty? Filling this up to the top. Yes, please. Give it all some fresh soil for the autumn. Mm hmm There's pansies and violas to finish off the top. What do you think? It's fantastic. Give me five. Thanks to Kirsty's hard work and devotion. I want to get my plants hydrated. This garden has transformed and made such a difference to our family. I love gardening. Oh, are you proud? Yeah, I'm proud. You should be. You've done a brilliant job. You're incredible. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's making you a bit emotional, isn't it? Yeah, a you, bit of emotional. You love it, don't you? Yeah, I do. What we could do now, with the other plants that we've got left, mm -hmm. we could plant up that plant over there, mm -hmm. like that one. Shall we create Rebecca a nice little fairy garden? Oh, um, yeah, please. Shall we do that and surprise yeah. her? Yeah. Oh, let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's let's do it. it. Come, on. Come on, then. Woohoo! Woohoo! This planter needs grit, as we've bought plants that don't need much watering, and they'll surround very special fairy buildings. I like them on every night. They have pretty colours. There's carefully placed toadstools. But someone has caught wind of our surprise. No peeping, Becky! No peeping, -pee, Becky! With all the plants popped in, there's a layer of grit on top and some final touches. A nice little path to the front door. There you yeah. go. There you go. And then it's time for the big reveal. Come and see what Kirsty's made you. Look at her. I'm making a wonderful, favourite fairy garden for you, Beck. Because I love you. Surprise, darling! You love it, don't you? Yep. 
<laughs> she had most toots. She is the most toots, isn't she? Yeah. What did you say to Kirsty, Becky Boo? So, what do you think? <laughs> no, she likes it. I love you. Yeah, I love you too. Job well done. And your feedback. Aww. Okay. It's been a great day in a great, great garden. Becky's happy, and we've made this gorgeous fairy garden. A fairy garden. Ta -da! Ta -da! I'm sure next spring that is going to provide a riot of colour and no doubt an awful lot of joy. So it's that time of year when we've gone back in, the fire's on, maybe you're reading a book, you might possibly be planning what you're going to do next year. But what about all your tools that are in the garage or the shed? Fantastic time of year just to take a moment, sharpen things up, clean them, oil them. I'm just sharpening this knife, which is probably one of my most precious bits of gardening kit. I'm just using a little sharpening stone. All I do is two or three one way and two or three the other. I'm just wedging my nail underneath that blade and that keeps the same angle all the time. There is something incredibly <laughs> relaxing about doing that. You just lose yourself. Now, back in June, Carol went to Hannam Court in Bristol, just as the roses were hitting their peak. This is such a magical time of the year for me when spring slowly gives way to summer. As the trees wake up, their growing canopy turns out the lights. The whole woodland floor now is a mass of green, beautiful foliage, but not a flower in sight. But outside the woodland garden, on the edges where the sun is streaming down, nature is erupting everywhere you look. Just look at this beauty, tumbling all over, cascades of glorious white flowers growing through this ancient hawthorn. And it just says, summer, aren't we lucky to be alive? The insects are buzzing, the birds are singing, and the flowers are certainly blooming. The gardens here at Hannam Court have taken 30 years to develop. They were created by Chelsea Gold medalists Isabel and Julian Bannerman. Hannam Court is just one of the marvellous gardens they've made. But this was their own private playground, the place where they could indulge themselves, both as far as design goes and plants. The whole place is just bursting with the most glorious combinations, the most beautiful colours. But at this moment, it's the rose that steals the show in all its myriad forms. It's wonderful. What is it about the rose that makes it so entrancing? Put purely and simply, they inject the whole place with a sense of romance and joy, perfectly set off with this Gothic architecture. Just take a look at that. Need I say any more? Climbing roses are by far the most impactful group of roses. And here at Hannam, they're used to full effect, clothing each and every tree and wall.
Well, roses have got a bit of a bad reputation for being thorny beasts. But when you see a sight like that, this rambling raptor climbing up the side of the house, who cares about a few thorns? But thorns are an essential bit of kit for the rose. We call them thorns, but they're actually prickles, they're modified stems. And they were there initially for the rose to be able to latch onto bark, twigs, stems, branches, whatever the host had, to haul themselves up into the sunlight. All of them are curved downwards, so they really act as hooks. And of course, any hungry herbivore who comes along is going to think twice about munching a stem that's covered with this kind of armour. But not all roses head for the sky. They can be used in an entirely more controlled and formal way. One of the most wonderful things about the way that roses are used in this garden is just how versatile their forms are. Look at this. This whole pathway is lined with these glorious standards. But not all of us have endless views. For a lot of us, space is limited, and this is the perfect solution. This is Alberic Barbier. It's usually a rambler, but it makes a perfect standard here. If you must have a rose and you want to enjoy it, and enjoy it not just in the round, standing on a stem, but at nose height too. Because one of the most important things about growing any rose is its scent. I think we all now realise that roses are at their best when they're in mixed company. What a delightful sight this is. This is a rambling rose, Felicitae perpetuae, with these musk-scented, gorgeous white flowers. And it's scrambling over this wall, accompanied by wall valerian, Centranthus ruba, a very common sight. The two really serve each other beautifully well. And in the bed below, this glorious double pink rose, this is Queen of Denmark, Conningham van Denmark, with these big, almost centifolia sort of flowers. And on its own, it would look lovely. But here, it looks so at home. It's side by side with geranium psilostemon, anthriscus, and delphiniums to match. Everything in the bed looks as happy as can be in this glorious mixed company. For me, peonies are amongst their best companions. And here, these white peonies work perfectly with this all-white scheme. And just look at this cranby. That has white wedding written all over it. It's a bouquet on a grand scale. But as summer gives way to autumn, Roses are plants that just keep on giving. This has to be one of my favourite group of roses, Rosa rugosa. This particular one is called Rosary Delay, and it's got so much going for it. If you've got really light soil, well-drained, sandy, limey, chalky, this rose will grow for you. Makes a wonderful hedge, absolutely splendid rose. And what's more, come the autumn, <laughs> The whole thing will turn golden and it'll be filled with great big orange hips. Perfect for the birds and if you want to make some rose hip jelly. A rose is a rose is a rose. Or is it? Roses are the most meaningful of all plants and the most diverse. But whatever roses mean to you, one thing is for sure. The rose has to be the epitome of summer.
who does not love a rose? But if I could only choose one type, it would have to be the ramblers. I just think they're absolutely glorious. And not just the flower, those incredible hips that carry through the winter months. And that's exactly what I'm gonna put up my rose arch. And remember, the winter is a great time to get your bare root roses in. Looking at my little arch, I'm gonna go for one called Mulvern Hills. Grows to about four and a half meters, soft, lemony flower, and then followed by those incredible hips. But what's even better is it repeat flowers. Growing sun, semi-shade, fantastic worker. And even if it does just escape the top of those arches, you can start to wire it into the wall. So, back to this. So what I've done is I've sanded these posts down, but I don't want to leave it at that. I want to detail them. The ends I've cut at 45 degrees, and it just ends up as a little sort of drip so the water doesn't run down the timber. But this is the bit I want to add now. So about 100 million from the post, what I want to do is just take a simple chisel and I'm going to cut a tiny little notch. And then I'm going to move to the other end, exactly the same distance. And what that's going to do is work as a stop for what I'm going to do next. What I love about timber is incredibly tactile. So what I want to do is take the edges off these corners. So I've done all four corners of my vertical posts and then the two undersides of the horizontals. So as you come through, it just feels slightly more tactile and you want to touch it. It just welcomes you in. Good girl. Good girl. Come on. Well, I will still be really busy in the garden over the winter months, but I'm afraid that is it from us, isn't it? What do you mean, no? Yes, it is it from us, but Monty will be back next week at Long Meadow. It's Christmas time, so let's enjoy it. So Arthur, that looks amazing. <laughs> well, thank you, they Already, kind. I love those <laughs> alliums. Oh, it's really beautiful. I'm so lucky, this is a beautiful light today. I have to say, what a day to visit this garden. Not all conifers are evergreen, are they? Like, a lot of the larches take on fabulous autumn colours. And then they're just so vibrant when they burst through with their foliage in the spring and it does something for every season. In the meantime, look after yourself. Bye-bye. Oh, gorgeous. Hey. Oh, dear. <laughs>